Hey, it is so good to see everybody this morning. Man, I'm excited about preaching this morning. I'm excited about being here with y'all. It is just always such a blessing. And me and these guys and girls up here and all of us working for the Lord this morning. And we just want to just thank God for the privilege of getting to do it. It's the greatest privilege on the face of the earth to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and to lead people in worship. And I'm so glad you got on up and come to church this morning. Amen. Pray God just blesses the hound out of you being here. We're going to be in the book of Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to continue in the series I'm preaching up until Easter called The Climb to the Cross. The Climb to the Cross. Last week I talked about, you know, um, whenever he raised Lazarus from the dead in that time right before he was fixing to make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. After that, whenever um, the chief priests and, you know, all them, they came out to see Lazarus afterwards when they were over there at Simon's house in they wanted to, they decided then when they seen Lazarus there and they knew that they could not, you know, take and discredit the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead, they decided to kill him and they decided to kill Jesus. And so now at this time, we're going to back up a little bit into on Matthew's account of, you know, Mary pouring that oil out upon Jesus. And we're, we're going to dive into that this morning. And kind of the title this morning of this sermon is Sold Out or a Sellout? Sold Out or a Sellout? Now, somebody that's sold out, you know, they completely, the, the exact definition of being sold out is you've submitted yourself completely to someone or something. You've committed yourself, you submitted yourself completely to someone or something. And that's what we all should be as Christians with Jesus Christ. And a sellout is someone who, you know, has declared their obedience to something or their commitment to something, but breaks that off and, you know, turns on that for some gain of their own or something else they want. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're just going to simply walk through the Word of God. It won't take very long, I don't feel like, this morning. We're just going to simply walk through the Word of God, and we're going to look at two people. You know how, like, whenever you're looking in the mirror, and sometimes, I don't know, like, when y'all woke up this morning, it may have been too early for you. I don't know. But when you look in the mirror, sometimes you kind of catch a glimpse of somebody, you know? It's like sometimes, Miss Tiny, when I look in the mirror, I just catch a glimpse of my dad because... I see a little less hair, a little more gray. You know what I mean? You start looking more and more like your parents did when you were little. And so I'll see a little bit more of my dad sometimes in the mirror. And then, um, and then, oh, one thing I got to do. John and Caitlin are here. Can y'all show them Olivia, their new baby that's just been born? She is so pretty. Here, yeah, look at that. Yeah. Uh, he, she is beautiful, John. Thank God she looks like her mom. <laughs> Can I get Amy in here? Amy, yeah, everybody's laughing. All right, but listen. So like normally before COVID even, you know, I would go and I, they call me a baby hog. I try to beat the grandmas to see the baby, okay? And so they'll let the preacher in a lot of times really, really easily. So I try to get there and, and when I'm sitting there holding the baby, sometimes, you know, usually the mom is there, maybe mother-in-law or father-in-law or something, and they're all talking and, and you know, one of them will say, oh my gosh, um, she looks just like her mama, you know. And then people from the other side of the family say, oh my gosh, she looks just like her daddy. She's so beautiful. And then as they get older, you know, and they, they go to doing something, they start acting like you, you start saying, oh boy, she's acting like her mama today. <laughs> you know, but you see a glimpse of yourself or they see a glimpse of when you were a child in that baby. And so we understand what it's like. And so this morning, a glimpse means just take a short, brief look at something. And so we're going to take a short, brief look this morning at two people. And we want to, what the, the point of this whole sermon is this, that by the end, you can look at these two people and you can say, do I see more of this person in me or do I see more of this other person in me? And the two people we're going to take a glimpse of this morning and take a quick look at are Mary and Judas. And we're simply just going to take the scriptures right here in, in Matthew 26 and walk down through them and talk about the things that they did, these two people did, and put them up against one another and see who we see in ourselves in the way that we worship, in the way that we serve, and how faithful we are to God. So let's stand in honor of reverence for reading God's word. Matthew chapter 26, verse 6, and we're going to go, go, go down to verse 16. It says, Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the Leopard. So see, Mary and Martha, they, you know, Martha come and served the dinner, but it was at Simon's house. You know, Martha loved serving dinner. That was her thing. They were friends with this guy. So here they are. This is another man. He couldn't have been around them if Jesus hadn't healed him from his leprosy. They didn't let lepers interact with people unless he had been declared clean. So here stands another miracle alongside the Lazarus that God, that Jesus had performed. Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, 
poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when the disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached, in the whole world, there, whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, and be told for a memorial of her. And when one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went into the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And for that time he sought opportunity to betray Jesus, or to betray him. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just pray to you, bless the reading of your word. I pray, God, that you just reach down from heaven. Just help us right now to get our mind off of everything else. And Lord, just take us back to this place on your path climbing to Calvary. You just help us to envision what goes on with these two folks in our mind. And speak to our hearts through your word this morning. Speak to our hearts. Lead us. Guide us to the truth you want us to hear. And then help us apply them in our lives. Because we want to honor you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we're the first person we're going to look at that we're going to talk about Jesus' encounters on his way to the cross is Mary, okay? So Mary was the sister of Martha, Mary from Bethany, okay? And so you last week, whenever I talked about that over in John chapter 12, it's the other account of this same thing, and you can see a few more details about what went on with Mary there. But we talked about it there, but we're going to go back and we're going to take a look at what goes on with Mary. Now this is right before Jesus is going to be crucified and right before he was going to be buried, okay? And when we look at this, I just want to take a few of these words at a time and just take a look at who Mary was and how she went about worshiping and serving God and what she did in this moment. This beautiful, beautiful moment that Mary just came and poured herself out upon Christ. So you can learn a lot from Mary. And I believe, you know, it says there that, you know, that she, that where this gospel is preached, that, you know, she'd be honored for what she'd done. And I believe God put this in Scripture as a great example to us of how our hearts should be toward God and how we should serve God. So pay close attention this morning to the little things, the simple things that Mary does as she loves on Jesus. And so it says first in verse 7, Luke, we'll start in verse 6. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the Levin, there came unto him a woman. I want you to listen to the first two words. There came. There came. Jesus didn't ask Mary to come and anoint him. Mary just did it because Mary wasn't having to be asked. She wasn't having to be pushed. She wasn't having to be prodded to do things to honor God and to serve God. She didn't have to be guilted to go into doing it. Mary was looking for opportunities any way she could to serve Jesus and to honor the Lord. See, that's one of the things we want to look at Mary at and we want to see that if it's in ourselves, are you looking for opportunities to serve God? Are you eager to serve God and glorify the God that saved you? See, Mary loved Jesus so much because Jesus had saved her. Jesus had forgiven her. Jesus had given her eternal life. And Mary loved Jesus so much that Mary was looking in her life in any way she could honor the Lord and she could serve God. The next thing I want to look at is this. I want you to think about this. You know, she was sold out. She was completely surrendered to God, but she came. But whenever she came, look at what it says. Unto him a woman. And this is Mary. And it says in the next part of the verse, having an alabaster box of very precious ointment. An alabaster box. Just that alabaster box Henry, it was very expensive. And that oil, that ointment in there was costly. It was so costly, you could probably, you could take the average income in America today and you could put it against that, that you know, out of basket box full of oil and a, America's average salary would be equivalent to what it cost her back then. So if you make $50,000, you make $30,000, you make $70,000, that's what was poured out on Jesus' head. So she didn't care what it cost her to serve God. You see, you hear people say, I don't have time. You hear people say, I don't want to give my money. You hear people say, 
I don't want to serve. I don't want to give up my life. She didn't care. It is costly serving God. But see, what you see in Mary's life is Mary didn't have to be asked. She was looking for ways to serve God. And Mary did not care what it cost her. I guarantee you, Mary was so in love with Jesus and so wanted to honor Jesus in that moment before he was taken and crucified in his death that she didn't even think about the cost of what she was pouring out upon him. She probably didn't even think about the cost at all. She just thought it was the only thing fit that she could do in that moment for the Lord. She probably didn't think about the cost until the disciples, the ones closest to Jesus at that time, the ones who also claimed to be following Jesus at that time, and completely surrendered and sold out to God at that time. Mentioned something. That's probably the first time she thought about what it was costing her in that moment to do it. So you see in Mary that you didn't have to ask her. You didn't have to hunt her up to go serve God. And she did not care what it cost her. I meet so many people that aren't serving God. Because whether they want to admit it or not, they don't want to pay the price. And see, we need to see Mary in our lives. We need to see glimpses of Mary in the decisions we make in how we use our time, how we use our treasure, how we use our talents. But she, was, she painted, Hannah, I'm telling you, this is a beautiful picture this lady painted of sacrifice and service to God. And then you look at it and you think about it, she spared no expense. She didn't just give what she had to her. Brother Ramos, she spared no expense. She did the most she could do for God. See, she didn't care that it may have costed her. You understand that's a year's worth of wages. She didn't care that it might cost her her comfort. She may not could go do the things she wanted to do financially because she gave that. She may have been saving that. That was a commodity back then. That's why they sometimes you know, held their value in their money. She didn't care if she maybe didn't get to go on the trip she wanted. Or maybe had to change her lifestyle so she could do it. Because it was costing her so much. She didn't even think about it. She did not care what it cost her. She spared no expense. And she didn't even have to be asked to do it. Then the next thing you think about is, you know, she, she really, whenever you look at this and you think about these verses, it says, and poured it on his head as he sat at me. Now, back then, they didn't like, you know, Tyler, you built a lot of wood stuff. They didn't like sit in chairs at the table. They kind of lay down on their hip, on their side, and the tables are down. They're kind of low where you can eat. I've seen some of the top things whenever I was over there, but you just kind of have to see it to understand the way they were there. But he was laid down there, and they were fixing to eat. And Mary come in, and you can read even more details about this in John. But Mary had come in and she took and poured that out upon Christ. And then she took her hair and she washed his feet with that oil with her hair. See, she didn't, she didn't mind that she had to get close to Jesus. She didn't mind getting close to Jesus. So you meet people that they don't want to get closer to God because if they read their Bible, then they may be convicted and then they may have to change their life. So Randy, instead of reading the Bible and changing their life, they just don't read the Bible and plead ignorance. Or they don't really want to serve God, so they don't read their Bible, they don't prepare themselves to serve. So when someone asks them to serve, they say, I'm just really not ready to do that yet. And sometimes you hear that for like 10 years. I'm like, oh, well, you're going to be old one day. You can't do some of these things. Like, then are you going to do it? I'm just, I'm just asking a question. Simple this morning. Very simple. I know this is going to be a quiet service. Because I was real quiet when I was reading it. The Lord started putting these thoughts in my head, Tony. I was like, oh, Lord. This lady was really awesome compared to me. But you know what? She wasn't afraid to get close to God. It didn't matter what she had to change. It didn't matter what she had to do. And she'd come home to she knew who God was and she knew who she was. She come home. She come listening. She wasn't telling God what to do like most of us do when we pray. 
She wasn't afraid to get close to God. No matter where she had to be, no matter what she had to change, she was willing to get close to God. So do you see that in your life this morning? Do you see in your life, do you see Mary in that you don't have to be asked to serve? Do you see Mary in that you don't have to be asked to give? Do you see Mary in the fact that it doesn't matter what it costs you, you're going to spare no expense in serving God? Do you see Mary in your life that no matter what it costs you, Paul said he was willing to endure torture and pain to understand more of what Jesus went through and who he was? Do you not spare any cost in getting closer to God? Are you willing to get close to God? Because, see, she was willing to get close to God. To get close to God, you got to get further from the world. You can't be married to Christ unless you're divorced from the world. That's right. That's right. And some people are not willing to be divorced from the world, so they'll never be close to Christ. And that is a choice. You have a choice. Mary made a choice to be close to God. But then you look on at what Mary did, and you just think about what she did in verse 12. It says, For in that she had poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Now, if you've read the Gospels, you see in there that many times Jesus had told the disciples that he was going to die. He was going to be crucified. He was going to be lifted up. He was letting them know, hey, I'm going to be crucified. He said, I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried for three days and I'm going to rise again. He told them time after time after time, that's what was going to happen to him. And you know what? Even in all those times, he explained it to them. This was God himself explaining to them. They didn't understand it and they didn't believe it, Floyd. They had seen the miracles Jesus had done and they thought there is no way you know, they thought they were misunderstanding what he was saying. They didn't get what Jesus was saying when he said he was going to die. He was going to be buried. He was going to rise again. But Mary, you see in verse 12 that Jesus said that Mary has done that for my burial. See, Mary slowed down and quit trying to tell God and trying to get something out of God. She wasn't, had no motives when she came to God other than to worship God. And so what she did is she understood God better. Because you, when you come willing to give to God and wanting to give to God, and you come willing to sacrifice and you want to get close to God, you're going to understand what God wants to do and what God wants you to do even better. That's why she understood what was fixing to happen and had more faith in Jesus' words that he was going to die and rise again than even his disciples. You see that in Mary, see? But God was asking me, not do I see that in Mary, God was saying, do you see that in you? And then he, she just goes on to keep going and keep going. You know, because of her faith, she could see what was coming. And listen, a lot of times we get caught up in what people think and what people are going to say. Now this lady come in there and she knelt down. All these men, which some people back then would call them proper, and she knelt down and she took her hair and washed his feet with her hair. Now, Dudes in here don't get the gravity of that, but I get the gravity of that simply because I've been married a long time. And my wife, if she had to go to the ER, then she would go to her hair appointment, then the ER. <laughs> Women do not reschedule their hair appointments. I'm telling you right now. Am, can, I, can I get an amen, ladies? Amen. She took her hair. She didn't care that her hair was a mess. She didn't care what she looked like to other people. She didn't care what other people thought. You know, whenever I was, I just got saved, there was an evangelist that come to um, Yawn's Chapel. His name was Bill Sturman. My grandmother, she's dead and gone now, but I never heard her get mad with a preacher ever, except one time. And I'll tell you what it was about. Like, Brother Bill Sturm came, and he was just joking. Like, he was joking, but maybe, maybe he understood what he was saying, and maybe he didn't understand the gravity. But he said, you know, these old ladies in here, and he said, they tell me they can't drive to church on Sunday night because it may get dark. He said, but if their hair point was at midnight, they go, oh, she got mad. <laughs> she got mad. And then he went on to say, and he was just talking about, you know, how much the, if you broke down the human body and the elements, like how much clay it is, it's only worth a worth buck 25. And he said, I just don't understand why somebody go get a $100 hair doing a 25 cent head. And I was like, oh. <laughs> she got mad with him. The Bible says a woman's hair is her glory. It's beautiful. She didn't care. She didn't care. Because she wanted to honor Jesus. And that would bring her even closer to the Lord. She didn't care what people think. There may be people in here today that you haven't gotten saved because you care what people think. She didn't care. She didn't care. And if you're going to be saved, you want to see some of Mary and you.
Because you might have to quit caring about what people think. Or you're going to worry yourself straight to hell. But listen to what she went on to do. She didn't care what had, that she'd be ridiculed. If you look at verses through verses 9-11, it says, For this woman might have been sold for much and given to the poor. It says in verse 8, But when the disciples saw it, they had indignation. In other words, they got mad because she poured out this oil of great worth on Jesus. And they rebuked her for it. So that she didn't care that even the, even the, even the people that were following Jesus would get mad at her for doing what she's doing. She didn't care about the rebuke and the ridicule she'd get from the world or from the people in the church or anybody else. It did not matter to her because Christ, she loved him so much he had forgiven her. He loved her. He had raised, he had raised her brother from the dead. And she knew he was going to raise her from the dead. She was a sinner, a dirty sinner like all of us. And God forgave her and cleansed her heart. So she didn't care if she got her hair dirty. She didn't care what she spent. And she didn't care what they said. And I just feel like it's time that the church gets some of that in them. But listen. Listen. She didn't care that she would be ridiculed. So when we look at Mary, we see just this beautiful picture. We see this beautiful picture. But then we move on to the next person right after that. You look in verse 14. And there's a man named Judas. Now Judas, Judas, let me just tell you some things about Judas. Judas claimed to be a follower of Christ. That's important. When we walk through this, that's important. In modern day church, he would say he was saved and born again and a follower of Jesus. He would say he was a Christian. That's what he said. That's not what he was, but that's what he said. I want you to understand that about Judas. Another thing is, he was serving God at the time. He was walking with God at the time. So, in other words, he would have been sitting in the church. He would have been serving on the committees. He would have been doing the ministries. He would have been walking with God's people. So, you see, you can be like Judas, Judas and you can see glimpses of Judas in your life even if you claim the name of Christ and say you're a Christian and even if you're walking among God's people that does not mean you're not like Judas that's not the difference between Mary and Judas so that's important but it goes on to say this it says then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest the thing that you see about Judas that I believe God wants us to look at this morning one of the things is he was looking. He went looking. He was always looking for a better deal. He was always looking for a better deal. In modern day America, you couldn't describe most people in churches any better than that. They're looking for a better deal. They're looking for something that will give them more. Which way is your attitude? Are you looking for ways to serve God? Or are you looking for a better deal? And listen, let me tell you, let me clarify for you. There's only two places you can be. God says you can either be for him or against him. When he says for him, he means dead flap in the middle of his wheel. So if you're not like Mary, you're like Judas. You can't say, well, I'm not like Mary, but I'm not like Judas. No. You're either like Mary and you're sold out, you're completely submitted to God and, you know, doing what God wants you to do or you're like Judas. You're looking for a better deal. Look at what he goes on to say. This, I'm just reading these verses, y'all. I'm just telling you, I ain't trying to fancy it up because what it convicted the hound out of me. But listen to what it says. And he said to them, what will you give me? See, it's like that sometimes when people want to ask about the church or they want to come join the church. Sometimes you hear people say, you know, I'm looking for a place I can serve. I'm looking for ways I can give back to the church. And then you hear other people say, well, what's the church offer me and my family? What do I give? And they're not looking for a place they can give and serve. They're looking for a place they can give. And see, that, that decides whether you're like Judas or you're like Mary. Not me, not what you think, not what you say. Your attitude towards serving God. Your attitude toward Christ and what Calvary means to you. 
Jesus was fixing to go to Calvary, and because he was fixing to go to Calvary, and because his ointment was poured out, Judas went ahead and sold, you know, sold Jesus out. When he seen he couldn't get anything more out of him, he left and he sold out. See, there's some people that will be sitting there and they haven't went to the point Jesus, uh, Judas went, but they just ain't got all they can get out of it. But once they do and they see it's not giving them what they want, they're going to sell out and they're going to go. Can I say to decide to rip the other level we're better off without them? Just put that in modern day church. The Marys are better off without Jews. We're better off without people that are coming to give. Now you may come because you have a need, because you're hurting, because you're unsaved, because you don't have peace. Those things bring us to the feet of Jesus. But when we're saved and we get right with God, we don't continue in that avenue. We become like Mary. God gives us a new heart and we begin to give and pour out and see how we can give instead of how we can take. Because you can't be like Christ and be a taker. You're not a Christian. Christian means a Christ follower. But he said, what will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And we look at Judas and we think he's crazy. And we think, oh my gosh, how could a man walk with Jesus? How could a man be that close to Jesus and then sell him out? And then he sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. Mary gave a year's worth of wages. Poured it out upon him. Never get, when you pour out some light, you're never getting it back. Judas sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, which was like the price of a, a common slave back then. So he sold himself into slavery of sin for the price of a slave. He bought his own slavery. And he was so cheap. In modern day America, I kind of did a comparison and best I could figure it out, somebody made something different. It's about $3,500 to $8,000 he sold him out for. You think, my goodness, he was cheap. But then it comes to the question, what did the devil in the world buy you with? If you're like Jews. What was your price? Was it pleasure? Was it convenience? So you could have more time to do what you want? Was it comfort so you wouldn't have to give, you could just get something else instead? Was it your hobbies? Was it your career, your business? What did he buy you out with? Because if you're not a Mary, you've been bought out. There's something else sitting on the throne of your heart and your life. There's something else that is more important to you than Jesus if you're not serving him like Mary. Now, you might not know what it is. You might not believe me when I say that right now, but that is the truth. You go home and you pray about it, you think about it, and you start looking at your life. You can look around and probably what you're spending the most money on and the most time at, that's probably an easy way to figure it out. That's what he bought you out with. Probably the thing you don't want to give up, the thing you don't want to change to go serve God, the thing that pops in your head, that's probably the thing he bought you out with. So you sold out. So you see more of Judas in yourself than you see of Mary. And then it goes on to say in verse 16, it says, And from that time, he saw the opportunity to betray him. You say, well, what's that got to do with modern day America? Well, I'll tell you what it's got to do with modern day America is, he done made up his mind he'd gotten all he was going to get. He done got started getting frustrated with Jesus and the way, the life Jesus was living. You understand, he didn't just leave Jesus, he left the life Jesus was living. He got frustrated with it where he was at because he wasn't getting what he wanted to get. He done made his mind up. He looked for an opportunity to sell him out. He looked for a better deal. He found a better deal. And then he wanted to find, listen to me, he saw opportunity and there's convenience wrapped up in that too. He was looking for a convenient time. He was looking for an easy time. He was looking for a time where, you know, they wouldn't even realize he was doing it so other people wouldn't look down upon him. He actually walked up to Jesus in the garden and he gave him a kiss to let him know that was Jesus and he that's, that's the way he betrayed the Lord. And see, that way he didn't look like a bad guy. 
And what I find is when people get all they can get out of a place and they get ready to move on because they're getting frustrated because people aren't doing what they want them to do, then they look for an opportunity to betray. In other words, they say, well, you know what? My toenail was hurt. I didn't tell anybody, but Brother Greg could have telepathically knew my toenail was hurt. He didn't come check on me. You think that's totally ridiculous, but there's been things like that go on. Not as many with me. We got, you know, a great church, but I've heard some doses. I mean, honestly. Just think about it. Just think about the reasons people say they leave and they go. And it, it makes it, they find a way to try to make it sound so legit so it's not their fault. It's never anybody's fault when they leave. It's always somebody else's. Somebody said something to me wrong. Two people didn't shake my hand. Only one person shook my hand. The music, it ain't just like a lie. They just make it sound like I got to serve God or I ain't doing right. I get tired of getting preached too hard like that. I mean, think about it. Think about Mary when she went and she poured her heart out. In verses 9 through 12, she poured her heart out. You think about people that come and they pour their heart out. You think about when you come and you preach and you, you help all the people you can during the week, but you preach and you totally pour. When I come and preach, I pour myself out. I don't take nothing home with me. I leave it all right here. I've never not done that one time. Amen. These people that come and sing, they sing their hearts out. They prepare. They spend their life to be able to play these instruments and do what they do. Stephanie serves her heart out. Buddy, Lord knows, I try to slow him down and get him to rest, but he's like a daggum energizer bunny. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Probably drive Daniel crazy. But when a person like Mary is all in and she pours her heart out, can you imagine after she poured her heart out, she gave a year's worth of wages, she washed his feet with her hair, she had to hear other people complain? I want to tell you something you might not understand, but when I come and pour my heart out, when these people come and pour their heart out, when the leaders in this church pour their heart out, they're empty when they're pouring it out. And they're the most vulnerable. And you're, when you're the most vulnerable, your heart can be hurt the worst. So the worst thing that disciples could have done was complain to Mary when she just poured it all out. But Mary didn't quit. Mary didn't go home. Mary didn't get mad and leave. She just kept loving on Jesus. But can I tell you something, love? You can, you can cuss me out and say, I'll tell you, very few things are going to keep me up. I'm going to sleep. The Lord said, he's up. His children go and sleep in Psalms. I'm going to take him up on that. I'm just like, they'll get over it. But can I tell you in love, not everybody's got my personality. Can I tell you in love that pastors under 40 are leaving the pulpits by the droves? Can I tell you that 90% of, of teenagers by the time they're 23... Never darken the doors of a church. And you know the main reason? Because of what them disciples did. And because of people like Judas. They're just there to get what they want. And all they do is fuss and complain. And they don't give and they don't go. And it tears those Mary's people's hearts out. And some of them ain't like me. They leave and they never come back. They never open their heart. They, they just don't feel like they can ever... Pour it out again like Mary did. Because they got hurt so bad when they did. By the very people they thought would appreciate it the most. You get what I'm saying? There's some gravity to Mary and Judas. There's some deep, everlasting, God worries about in a deep way. Things about being like Mary or being like Judas. You can feel it in here today. I ain't got to tell you. You can see it in those pictures that they paint. I don't have to tell you. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about, you know, do you begrudgingly give? 
Do you begrudgingly go? Do you begrudgingly serve? Do you dismiss it because you don't want to pay the price? Do you complain? Listen, I'll explain to you something about the way we do the music. We try to do, we try to feed everybody. I, now you older people listen to this. We play newer music because that's what feeds your kids and your grandkids. So we do that so your kids and your grandkids will continue to come to our church. So you can have them in your church. There's a lot of churches. They have the kind of music they want all the time. The older people do, but they don't have any kids. Two and two equal four. Sometimes you get what you want and, and are most miserable. Younger people, you got to understand that these folks have been raised on this music they love, and they, they don't get fed the same way that new music, the same way you don't get fed the same way with old music. So we try to do some of both so everybody gets fed. So you don't need to complain when we play some hymns and we play some older stuff and we do it the old way. We can't please everybody all the time. You know when you come and complain to people about stuff like that? You know who you, a person like Mary knows you are? See, when they wrote this, when they wrote the Gospels, they said Judas, the one who took the bag and betrayed Jesus. Because looking back, they understood who Judas was. See, before this happened, before he betrayed the Lord, Judas was the most trusted person in their group. He handled the money. I promise you, Tony Cruz can stand up and tell you that people don't hand him money if they don't trust him. And so his trust is the thing he values the most in his life and in his job. Because you're not going to give your money to somebody you don't trust. And when they read the, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, and Jesus said that somebody was going to betray him, they didn't say, oh, it's probably Judas. No, they said, is it me? Nobody mentioned Judas. Except God pointed it out in the way that he did. But let me tell you something. Nobody thought of Judas. He was the most trusted person in the group. But just because, you know, people trust you, just because you walk with God's people, just because you say you're a Christian, doesn't mean you're not like Judas. Because he had all three of those things. And see, what happens when you complain like you do those things and you fuss about those little nitpicky things that don't matter nothing in eternity, let me just tell you something. We would do you a disservice by giving you what you want. Modern day America needs to understand that when you get what you want all the time, that is terrible for you spiritually, physically, and mentally. You don't need to get what you want all the time. That is healthy for you to learn to appreciate someone else what they love, to help you become a more giving person, a more flexible person, a more patient person. So if you're one of those people that drive people to always give you what you want, you're doing a disservice to yourself and to your children. And when your children lay down in the aisle and kick their feet and act spoiled because they got a $500 phone and they want a $1,000 phone, it's because they watched you operate. And they see it's how you get what you want in life, whether it's at your business, whether it's at your church or wherever you're at, you put pressure on people to get what you want without thinking about everybody else. So they learn it at home. And then so when they get 18 or 19 and they get mad because they don't get what they want and they're not your generation and your generation in control of what's going on in the church and they want something different than your generation wants and they leave, guess who taught them that? You understand? I'm just telling you it's a very serious thing. But the great thing, the most encouraging thing about this is I'm looking at a lot of marriages. There's a lot of you that you pour your heart out week in and week out and you give yourself to serving God and you don't care what people think and you don't care what it costs you. You don't care how tired you are. You don't care what you got to sacrifice. You don't care what you have to give up out in the world because you love Jesus and you want to serve Jesus. And I'm here to encourage you today and tell you that the same way that Jesus told Mary and told the disciples and straightened them out, he said that for eternity, the thing that she done and pouring out upon, out upon him will be celebrated and glorified God through all eternity. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus said in the book of Matthew that if you give a cup of water in the name of Jesus, that God will remember that for all eternity you'll be blessed by it. I'm telling you today, so keep being married. Keep pouring it out, no matter how much they complain. Keep pouring it out, no matter how much it costs.
Keep giving and giving because I know what you know that Jesus came and lived and died and poured his blood out for us. The Son of God, the, uh, the righteous, holy, cleanly life. God of the universe came down and picked up sinners, dirty sinners like me and you, and saved us and cleaned us up, and He's using us up for the glory of God to keep pouring it out like Mary did. Keep being Mary. Don't worry about the Judas in the world. Let me just tell you what happened to Judas. Mary was happy. Mary was joyful. Judas was so sad and grieved by what he'd done, he went out and hung himself. When he realized what he'd done, he went out and took his own life. So if you're married, keep on pouring it out. God loves you. God appreciates you. But if you're a Judas, let me give you some more encouragement. You say, how can I have encouragement if I'm like Judas? Judas went and killed himself because of selling out, selling out God. Well, just let me tell you, Judas was not the only one that abandoned God. I'm telling you right now that Peter, the leader of the disciples, he abandoned God. And in John chapter 21, Jesus caught back up with John and when he uh, with Peter, and when he found Peter, Peter wept. Peter wept. Peter wept. And he was broken. And he was torn apart. And he felt guilty because he'd been like Judas. He hadn't been like Mary. And he looked into the eyes of God. And when he looked into the eyes of Jesus, Jesus said, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? He said it three times. Peter, do you love me? Because Peter was questioning himself. Peter was beating himself up. Peter was living in misery and guilt. So the Lord asked him about the same thing that Peter was questioning about himself. Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, do you know I love you? Jesus didn't say I'm done with you. Jesus didn't say, shame on you. Jesus didn't say, I don't like you. Jesus said, well, feed my sheep. You know what that means? If you've been like Judas, you ask God to forgive you, and God will forgive you like he forgave Peter, and you can get up and use the rest of your life, whether it's 10 days or a 1,000 years, and use it for the glory of God. I serve a God that... When you've got sin, he's got more grace, praise God. He's got mercy and grace and forgiveness for all of us. No, your life might not be like it was before you sinned, but I'll tell you what, who gives a rip? You just take the best of what you've got left. You take what you have. You may not have a year's worth of wages left. You may only have a few days left in your life, but you take it and you pour it out on the, on the, on the head of the Son of God. You take the hair of your head and you wipe and clean the feet of Jesus and you go and serve the least of them. You go and serve the least of them. You go and help those that can't help themselves. You go take that cup of water. You go teach them babies. You go feed those hungry. You do whatever you can do to glorify God no matter what it costs. You just got to step up and step out. You got to step up. When God gives the invitation to come and repent, you got to bow yourself like Mary did down. You got to come repent of your sin. When you repent of your sin, God said when you humble yourself, He will lift you up. The God of this universe will lift you up. God wants you to come and repent today and He wants to forgive you and He wants to use you today. And I tell you what, if you're a Mary in here today and you've been serving God, I just pray this morning, you'd come down at this altar and you'd pray for the people who walked out. You'd pray for the people who you know were the most faithful people in church, but they sold out and they give up and they went on. Pray for them. You get out of this altar and pray for somebody that you know that God has used before, that was here in this place, that ain't here no more, that God wants to get a hold of. You come and start praying for them. Don't be mad at them. You start praying for them. And I tell you what, and when you get done doing that, if you're married, you just thank God. You just thank God that the God of this universe, the God of this universe, picked you, picked you at a critical time to do what He wants you to do. That we get the privilege we get the privilege to bow down and to serve Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no better place you can pour out your life than at the feet of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. And that's the invitation I give today is to come to Christ. To come to Him with thankfulness like Mary. To come to Him with, with repentant heart like Peter. Because God wants to use you no matter where you sit. You know, if you're unsaved in here today, God wants you to step up. He wants you to step out. He wants you to quit worrying about what it's going to cost you. He wants you to quit worrying 
about what people think. And he wants you to come. And he'll save you, I promise. If he did on your heart, he'll save you. Today. 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 And he's in this place right now. Old man is in this place. I know there's a lot of people felt encouragement today, and there's a lot of people being convicted. You just need to come. He's waiting on you. He knew Mary was coming. He was waiting on you. He was waiting on you. I'm sure he couldn't wait for her to come. God's waiting on you. He's been patient. He's been loving. He's been kind. But he's waiting on you to come. He's waiting on you. He can't wait to see you. Lord, I just pray, God, that you would just move in this place today. Lord, Mary so touched our hearts today. She's preached so well with her life. And Judas gave us the greatest warning we can ever have about wanting to take instead of give to God. And I pray today, Lord, as, as this whole congregation looks at these two people, they will be honest. They will be honest with you and honest with themselves. And they will say, am I more like Judas? Or am I more like Mary? And I pray today, God, if they don't see if they don't see the goodness of Mary's life in them, that they would come today and they would change it. Permanently and eternally. You brought this message to them today, God, because you want them to come to you. Lord, I'm just reminded in Psalms 51 when David committed adultery with Bathsheba and had killed a man to cover it up. Ten months later when he come back to you, he wrote in the book of Psalms 51. He said, Lord, return unto me the joy of my salvation. I pray for the folks that have sold out like David did in that moment. It happens to all of us. They remember the joy of your salvation. They feel how much they miss it. And they come home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Y'all stand and y'all come this morning. God leads you.